So at the end of our draw line method in our turtle demo class, um, let's more formally define um, these other these other types like int that we've been using that we haven't actually defined yet. So let's do a multi-line comment slash star enter, and we're going to do some examples. So if the type isn't a class type like turtle or world, then the type is what we call a primitive data type. And Java has several primitive data types. We call them primitive data types because unlike classes, primitive data types are defined as part of the Java language specification. Meaning when we use these types, they're going to show up in red because they're reserved words. When we type turtle or world or string, they don't show up in red. They're just Java classes. They might be defined in the Java standard library, but they're technically not part of the Java language specification. These primitive types are. Um, there are several. We're going to focus on just four in this class. The first is of type Boolean. So Boolean types, Boolean holds a value of true or false. And we're going to do an example down below as we go here. So here is a Boolean. I say Boolean, and you'll see it's colored red because it's a Java reserved word, is summer equals true. It still is summer. The other option is false. To contrast with Python, or Python does have a Boolean type, um, but we use, I believe, capital T true and capital F false, if I remember correctly. Whereas in Java, it's all lowercase. A little bit different. So we use Booleans from time to time. Another very useful primitive type is the int type. Int is short for integer. Int types, int holds an integer number. Okay. So an integer number is a, like, I mean it in the specific mathematic definition, it is a whole number, no fractional part. Um, however, there are some limitations. There are an infinite number of integers. We can't store an infinite number of different things in a computer in the memory. So we actually only can store a range of integers. Um, and then what exactly that range is and why, we'll study in our next unit. Um, for now, just be aware that like we can't store any integer, but we'll store the ones that are we most often care about. Sometimes we do need a fractional portion. So the type for that is called a double. A double holds a real number. You might also see it referred to as like a floating point number. The set of real numbers is infinite. We, again, can't store an infinite number of numbers in the computer's memory. So when we are storing real numbers, they are limited by their precision, okay, um, and they're limited by their range. And again, in the next unit, we'll focus on, on both of those limitations. You might be wondering, why is it called a double? Like, real would be a good name, right? Um, it's called double for historical reasons. So when computer memory was not as prevalent, um, when there was less of it, um, we would tend to store real numbers as um, what we call single precision real numbers. Um, and that would mean the range and the precision was even less than what we can do with our double type. And then as we got more memory, we realized, oh, okay, well, let's now create a double precision real number type that can hold a, a wider range and have more precision. So that's where double comes from. It comes from double precision. So it's more historical. Those are the only three types that are technically part of the Java subset for the AP exam. But there is another type we use in this class because it's really useful, um, and that's char. And the char type is short for character, and it holds a single character. Okay. Not a string, not several characters together, but a single character, like the letter C, or the character for the number 8, not 
the integer 8, but the character for the number 8. Okay. So let's add some examples of, of each of these. We've done in, uh, in stuff before, so we'll skip that one, but let's do a double. Here is a double. We can say double shows up in red, Java reserved word. Double sales tax rate, I think it's 7.5% in Naperville. 7.75, taxes are going up. All right, 7 and 3 quarters percent. Sales tax rate for Naperville. There we go. So if it's a double, we can have a decimal point, the real number part. Um, we can also use scientific notation like you do on your calculator with the E. That's allowed as well. Um, either way is fine. And here is a char. Char letter equals C. Oops, C. So when we want to specify a char literal, like a specific character, we put it inside of single quotes. Okay. We always use single quotes when specifying exactly one character. We use double quotes for strings. And we'll get to strings next week. Um, but just I just want to be clear that the type of quote we use is important. Single quote means it's a character. It's literally a character inside those single quotes. Double quotes means it's a string. And we'll get to that. These are the primitive types that we're going to use throughout the semester. In terms of our memory model, they all get like little pockets um, because we can put a true or false. We can put 0 0.0775 or the letter, single letter C in, on a sheet of paper inside that pocket. It looks out just fine. The next thing I want to, basically we're filling in some gaps here, things that we've been doing but we haven't formally defined. And the next thing I want to fill in a little bit more detail is we've been writing code, like even on like the very second day of class, we've been writing code that called methods, like forward, on variables that reference objects, like crush, with arguments that provide additional information, like 50. But we haven't really formally looked at the syntax of how do we call methods on variables that reference objects. So I want to take a moment to be very clear about that um, and fill in that, that gap. So we're going to do another comment block, block, slash, star, enter. And we're going to basically pick apart each identifier and symbol in a statement that invokes a method. So when invoking methods, we use the dot operator. And what I mean by the dot operator is the period. We use the dot operator to invoke a method on an object. In computer science, we use the word operator the same way you use it in mathematics. Um, in computer science, we just have a larger set of operators, but the definition and behavior is still what you're familiar with from math class. So in math class, you're used to operators like addition, subtraction, multiplication. Operators have operands. If I say 3 plus 4, the left operand is 3 and the right operand is 4. In computer science, our operators have one or more operands, just like in mathematics. The other important part of an operator is that it return, it evaluates to, it returns a value. When we say 3 plus 4, that evaluates to 7. Right? Whenever we use an operator in computer science, it returns some sort of a value. That could be like the number 7 if we say 3 plus 4. But another operator that we've already seen is our new operator. And the new operator returns a value. The value returned by the new operator is the reference to the object, okay? that address of where that object is in the computer's memory. The dot operator also returns a value, 
it's going to be the value returned by the method that we're calling. Okay? Um, some methods don't return values. Um, so we just say like it returns void, it returns nothing. Um, but other methods do. And so we're going we're gonna to classify our methods into two categories. All right. But before we get to the return value, let's focus on what happens after the dot. So go, I'm going to go all the way up to the top again, just as an example. Crush is our object variable. Here's the dot. Oops, dot. Here's the method name, forward. And then we have parentheses after that. So let's focus on the parentheses. Some methods take no arguments, but we still have parentheses. For example, the pen down method doesn't take any arguments. So we would just write crush dot pen down, but we still have the parentheses. The parentheses are required because that is the syn that specifies the syntax so that the Java compiler knows that pen down is a method and not something else. Okay? That's what the parentheses after it means. So that's required by the Java compiler. It's also really helpful for us. If we see an unfamiliar line of code and we see variable dot something with parentheses after it, we know that this something is a method because it matches the syntax for invoking a method. So it's required by the Java compiler, but it also helps us. So even if we don't need to specify any additional information, still need the parentheses. Some methods take one or more arguments, like forward. Crush.forward, go 25 steps. I said we were going to classify methods into one of two categories. Um, the first category we're going to refer to as mutator methods. Mutate means to change. So mutator methods modify the state. What I mean by state is the values of attributes. So mutator methods modify the state of the object pen down, forward, set pen color are all mutator methods. They all change the state of the object. When we say crush.pen down, the object referenced by crush puts the pen down. That changes the state of the object. The pen is now down. If we say crush.forward25, the position of the turtle has changed. We have changed the state. We have modified the state. If we say, let's see, crush dot set pen color, color dot red, that changes the state of the turtle referenced by crush. The color of the pen is now red. And then we can go forward again, too, if we want. So we can have two different colors here. Oops. Let's try forward. There we go. So when, when we invoke methods, it's object variable dot method name, parentheses, perhaps with something in between the parentheses, if we need to specify additional. I want to contrast that with like this little chunk of code right here. We don't really know what this is, this color dot red thing. Um, we will formally study this in a future unit. Um, but I like to bring it up now because even though we don't know really what that means, we can use our syntax clues to figure it out. We know that color.red is not invoking a method because there's no parentheses after red. So red can't be a method. 
The other thing we notice is that color, by convention, isn't a variable, it's a class because it starts with a capital letter. So there's a, currently a Java class called color. We're not sure what it means to use the dot operator after a class, um, but we also notice that red is in all capital letters. And that's our convention for something that is a constant variable, um, a constant value. So even though we haven't studied this yet, just using our syntax clues, we know that color is a class, we know that red is a constant, and perhaps we infer that the dot has something to do with saying, hey, there's this constant red associated with this class color. And if we figure that much out, like we're in great shape, even if we don't formally understand exactly that, that syntax. So I share this with you to like kind of encourage you Based on just the syntax clues we're learning so far, you can figure out a lot of unfamiliar code. So. All right, I said that we would have two categories. These are mutator methods. The second category, slash star enter, we're going to call accessor methods. Accessor methods return the value the value of an attribute of the object. To be clear, that means the state of the object does not change. Get pen width is an accessor method. So we'll add that as an example. I'll create a local variable of type int called pen width, and I'll assign it the value returned by calling the get pen width method on the object referenced by the variable crush. So the state of the turtle, that is the value of all its attributes, is exactly the same after we call get pen with as it was before we get pen with. Okay? So accessor methods don't change the state of the object. They're still really useful because sometimes we need to ask objects, hey, what is the value of this attribute of this? Okay? Like, hey, what's your pen with? Okay. And it's going to return a value like 3 or 10 or 100 or whatever it happens to be. The other cool thing about this statement here is something that we haven't seen before. Previously, when we've been declaring variables, um, in this case of type int, on the right side of the assignment operator, we've had just like a literal value, like 7 or 10 or 50. The right side of the assignment operator does not have to be a literal value. It can be any arbitrarily complex expression, as long as that expression evaluates eventually to an appropriate value, meaning a value of the right type. I can put anything on the right side of this equal sign as long as it evaluates to an integer number. That's super powerful. And we'll be doing more and more of that as we progress here. 